Meet the flow field, a multi-dimensional noise grid that determines the movement of objects that travel over it. I've never been one to fully understand the functional use cases of the flow field, but I've always been enamored wow. with the art it produces. As an artist who's done quite a few procedurally generated pieces in the past, I decided I'd like to give the flow field a go, translating what I produce on the computer to a physical version I can either hang on the wall, gift to a friend, or make that cash money by selling as an NFT. The creation of the standard flow field starts with a series of points laid out evenly across a plane. Once the points are in place, they are assigned a vector, basically just a coordinate that specifies what direction the point should push any object that travels over it. Now, these vectors can't just be determined randomly, otherwise we'd get a field composed of just pure chaos. Instead, they are generated what's known as Perlin noise. Perlin noise is the concept of generating randomized values that are semi-dependent on neighboring values. By producing semi-dependent randomization, our pieces begin to take life since points, vectors, and positions have a sort of flow to them, while still maintaining some sort of unknown randomness. And if you're wondering where the name Perlin Noise comes from, it's by your boy Ken Perlin, a mathematician who helped produce the Perlin Noise algorithm for the Tron movies back in the day. I had always thought the name Perlin Noise sounded cool, but I never actually knew what it was or how to use it. Thanks to the wonder that is YouTube though, I came across a tutorial by Daniel Schiffman from The Coding Train, which taught me pretty much everything I needed to know to get started. There weren't any up-to-date modern ES6 JavaScript libraries I found to apply Perlin noise to points, so using p5.js's Perlin noise function as a reference, I created my own library to easily import and utilize a variety of Perlin noise functions. With a few rounds of experimentation, I was able to apply Perlin noise to each individual vector within the flow field grid. I was already beginning to see how this relates to nature in some way. The very first thing I thought of when I saw this result was how it resembles the flow of a river. I'm very often thinking how much of the life we live in relates to code, as in, the very water within a stream is coded in some sort of certain way to behave as it does. It wouldn't surprise me if the inherent behavior of water molecules pushed by a force, utilize the math associated with a flow field in some manner. Existential thoughts aside, after creating some standard 2D canvas objects, I was able to modify their starting velocities so that I got continuous movement whether they were on or off the screen. The next challenge I faced was actually getting these particles to follow the direction of the flow field. Essentially, each particle needs to get the vector value of its nearest flow field line. Once retrieved, this vector value needs to be added onto the particle's acceleration, acting as a type of force which pushes the particle into the next flow field line. Wow. As it approaches the next flow field line, the particle recognizes that there is a new force pushing against it, thus it continues the process as it moves throughout the field. I struggled with this quite a bit initially. Retrieving the correct vector value based on a particle's position was something that I was unfamiliar with, so I studied up on a few similar code pens which utilized some position algorithms to retrieve each vector's corresponding force. Although I was able to get the particles moving in the right direction on my own, limiting each particle's speed was tricky since each velocity component needed to be reduced in relation to one another. As a result, I decided to implement a vector math library called Vectory, so I could easily retrieve the magnitude of my vectors and scale them down accordingly if they ever got too big. And with that, the particles finally followed a uniform path that was completely determined by the flow field vectors around them. Now, a singular ant marching line like this doesn't seem impressive at first, but once you start affecting properties unrelated to the particles acceleration algorithm, things start to get interesting. Let's start with our flow field. How would things look if we began to move our vector's directions over time? By setting each vector's angle based on a new noise value for each frame of our animation, our flow field begins to take life and obtains a wave-like animation of its own. Each vector pushes a particle like a pinball bouncing off of a paddle, so pretty cool if we're looking for some sort of effect that involves the movement of background vectors. But this, oh, this shall not do. Let's go ahead and take things to the next level. By commenting out the vector rendering and setting the canvas to only clear itself once, you can see we immediately upgrade from generative art script kitty to hey, I messed around with React for a week. As we turn down the opacity on each particle, this effect becomes even more unique. And if we change each particle to save its last position, 
then use that last position to draw a line instead of a circle. Finally, we have something that truly exhibits the beauty of the flow field. With time, effort, and a lot of stack overflowing in between, the possibilities of what you can produce with the flow field are truly endless. So with that, I'll leave you with the beauty of the flow field. Thanks for watching everyone. Be sure to subscribe and check out ChrisCourses.com for in-depth tutorials. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.